Thank you for joining us this morning for a live Q&A. It's beginner beekeeping Q&A this morning, so no such thing as a silly question. Ask your questions you're afraid to ask. We're all here to help you get started in beekeeping and there's a lot of other people in our community that are willing to help as well, so it's fantastic to see people answering all of those questions. We all started off as new beekeepers once, so don't be afraid to ask. Trace will read out your questions and I'll answer them live. And while we're doing that, we might even just harvest a bit of honey because it's springtime here. Well, it's actually still winter, but as far as the bees are concerned here in the subtropics in Australia, it is basically spring for the bees. The nectar flow is already starting to come in. We've got uh, a nice view of it here in the window. You can see the bees actually starting to cap off the cells of honey. Give us a thumbs up if you can see that capping that the bees are putting on. It's like a wax sheet they put over the honey when it's ready. And you can see a few cells that aren't still there on the edge. They're still busy putting the capping on. It's kind of like a lid on a preserving jar. And that means it's going to keep for the bees for the long term, but also for us in our jar because that moisture content is now down nice and low. The bees have put their energy into making it nice and thick and honey-like. And that way in the jar, it'll be good honey that will last. If the moisture content's too high, then what happens is you can actually get uh, fermentation occurring. So if you've harvested a bit early and you've got quite liquid honey, it doesn't matter too much. It just means you need to consume it or keep it in the fridge for a while. Otherwise, fermentation will occur. So I'm just putting the key in this top slot here. Going to get a little harvest of this frame. And this one's actually quite easy to turn. It does really differ turning the key. Sometimes the bees are, use their wax and propolis in a way that actually does uh, really lock the frame parts together. So beginner beekeeping, no such thing as a silly question. Put your questions in the comments below and we'll get to answering those. Here we have some honey just flowing out, which is exciting. I'm keen to taste the, uh, the new flavours coming in and see what they're like. Actually, I can already see this is quite a dark honey, which is the, uh, what we do get over the winter here when the bees are foraging on the heathland down here by the coast. And look at that beautiful dark honey coming in. It's often people's favourite when I uh, give them different honeys to taste. They like this dark, malty one. I'm going to have a little taste because I can't help it. Mmm. It is. It's that dark, malty one we get here in winter off the banksias and things in the in the heathland. It's a um, beautiful honey. Any questions coming in? Yes, Cedar, we've got a, um, someone on YouTube. Um, unfortunately, we don't have Facebook today, but Joe's asking, um, caught a swarm, and that looked like they were dying. Just wondering if you thought maybe they could have been sprayed. Uh, if you have a poisoning, which does occur sometimes, I've only ever seen it myself once in my life around here, but basically, if you see a hot carpet of bees out the front of the hive, it's normal to have dead bees at the front of the hive, but if you just see a carpet of them with their tongues hanging out, then that is a sign that they've had a poisoning. Perhaps they've somebody sprayed uh, insecticides onto flowers and the bees have gone to suck that nectar and they've got a load of poison. Um, but it, it's not that uncommon to catch a swarm and for whatever reason it doesn't make it as well. So you could just be unlucky there where um, the queen's not present or something like that and that the swarm is not able to get on its feet and create a, a hive. So um, get in there, have a look and see if you've got any brood in the brood box. Last week we did a, an inspection and we've got plenty of videos showing you how to do that. Also on the beekeeper.org, we have an online course, which is an amazing fundraiser as well. If you really want a, a, an online video course, get your rave reviews. We've um, planted over, uh, over 1.5 million trees now to create billions of blossoms for the bees from funds raised from that course. So you can have a look at that as well and get in there and see if you've got a, a queen right hive it gets called when you've got a laying queen. 
Got a little bit of rain here, so uh, one thing we can do, I don't think it's going to be too much, it'll be fine, but if you do have rain or you've got bees going for the jar, it's as simple as getting a bit of kitchen wrap. This is the, the type that's a substitute for plastic wrap for your kids' lunches. It's actually beeswax and, and oils and things in fabric, and that makes for a nice, um, a nice reusable plastic wrap. Great thing to have in your kitchen for your kids' lunches and so on. Uh, but you, yeah, you really need a little square of this and it can go around the top of the jar like that. So very simple way to do it. But as I said, any kitchen wrap will do it as well. We might leave it off just so we can watch that beautiful dark honey flowing into the jar. Nice, it's so dark today, isn't it? It is, beautiful dark honey. Yeah. And it's warm coming out because Ooh. the bees are keeping the hive warm. Mm. What does it taste like seeds? Where do you think? Because it was so light oh, last week. It's a good flavour. Ah. You might have to taste some, Trace. Oh, I think I better. I'm coming, <laughs> I'm coming in. It looks like it looks like golden syrup or molasses. Mm. Oh yeah. Wow. Do you get oh, that yeah. at your place with your hives? Yeah, but not that dark. I don't think I ever get honey that dark. I live about 20 kilometres in Mullumbimby and um, my honey's always lighter than that. I never get the dark one. Do you yeah. think maybe it's a yes. coastal thing or something? Yeah, it's just a, it's, it varies so much. And that's one yeah. of the unique things about beekeeping is your flavor will be unique to your area. And you get different flavors in the different frames as well. So that's really exciting to be able to taste all those different flavors. I really recommend harvesting single frames to, to the jar, not mixing all of the frames into a bucket like some people do. And that's just simply because you can enjoy the different flavours and bring that story of the different flavours to the table as well. It's been a, a real joy with the Flow Hive. It's a, it wasn't something we set out to do, my father and I, when we were inventing the Flow Hive, but it, it's been this amazing side benefit is the, uh, the way you can separate the flavours easily. Because I used to mix not only all of the frames from one hive, harvesting in the conventional way, but all of the honey from maybe 10 or 20 hives all together. And it's nice honey, but not as nice as being able to taste all the different flavors of the seasons in your, in your jars. Yeah, so nice. Seeds, um, Holy, Holly Go Walkabout's asking, do you have to check each frame before you harvest it? And how do you decide how many frames to collect from at a time? Okay, so we have designed it so you don't have to take your hive apart to harvest your honey. You can get quite a good idea from the windows what's going on in your hive. So I can see here, by the way the bees are closing in their caps, that there's a honey flow coming in. They generally start in the centre and fill up the frames and move out towards the extremities. So if, if these ones are uh, uh, getting close to filling up, then the ones next one in, which I've chosen, should be all capped. Now I say should be because sometimes you can get into the situation where the bees have eaten out a section above the brood nest in the centre here and they haven't filled it in. But, but after a while you get to have a fairly good idea by looking in the windows and seeing what's going on. If we have a look at this hive here, you'll get a, a, um, a good view of, of a few different things here. So this hive uh, did get a bit hungry and you see that by the checkered pattern when you've got full cells like that and then completely missing, full cells completely missing. So that was all capped and they started to eat it away. But now what's happening is the spring flows starting and they're starting to fill it in again. And that's a filling pattern here where you've got a whole lot about the same level. So this is the crossover between hungry bees and bees filling up the cells again. So once you get your eye in, and learn about what's going on, you can get a really good idea of when it's time to harvest and when it's not. So you see there, there's nectar coming in too, so that's a really good sign. Give us a thumbs up if you can see that nectar glinting down the cells. And so yeah, there's a few, few good examples here, just a little bit of nectar in the cells. And if we spin around to this hive here, you'll see that there's even more nectar in this one. So in another week or so, they'll be capping this off if the nectar flow continues. So there's a slow, steady nectar flow at the moment, but not a, not a huge uh, 
huge flow. If, if you get a big flow where the flowers are literally dripping to the ground with nectar, then they might even uh, fill that frame up in a day. Right. Seeds, um, this is a good one. Mackenzie's ask, can you point out how the bees get in and out of the hive? Could you point it out? And I think it's that thing too, I know when I first started, I always thought where we harvested from was the front of the hive because that was like a door. But yeah. I know that is wrong. No, we're sneaking the honey out <laughs> yeah, the back of the hive while right. the bees are doing their thing in the front of the hive. <laughs> <laughs> so um, here, here your bees are going in and out. So this is the landing board. Now, this is also where the bees will defend their entrance. So if I hang around out here, I'm more likely to get a sting. And that's why we like to harvest on the other side because bees are guarding that for robber bees that might come in or anything else that might come in to try and steal the honey. But with this um, flow frame invention, we have a mechanism where we can gently harvest the honey without taking the hive apart while the bees are still just doing their thing. And often it seems as though they barely even notice. Yeah, it's incredible. Seeds, so um, another question, in warm winters, should we, I'm not sure where um, this person is, they're coming in from Insta, in warm winters, should we leave the flow frames on and the queen excluder? Okay, if you've got a warm winter in your area, for sure, uh, we just leave it in this configuration all year round. Uh, if you're in a really cold place where you've got three, four, five months, no, uh, no flowers and snow and things, then you should be uh, preparing your hive for that long winter. But if you're in an area that's got warm winters and the bees can do a bit of foraging during the winter, then just leave the queen excluder in and you're super on all year round. So that makes it a little bit easier there. The, if you are in the colder places, then you'll be doing things like taking the excluder out so that the queen can move with the ball of bees as they bunker down for winter and travel up the hive consuming the honey that's in your top box or boxes. And um, that's why we remove the queen excluder in those really cold winter areas. Uh, but also ask your local beekeepers as well, they'll give you a good idea of what you need to do in your area for a cold winter or a warm winter. <laughs> in your case. Um, this is one from Shyman from my homelands of Aotearoa, wondering, he's, I've heard that New Zealand the honey is too thick there and cannot be used on the flow hive, just wondering what your thoughts are on that. That's uh, not true, we have uh, plenty of people using flow hives in NZ and uh, what you do get there's, there's a few things that can be too thick for a flow hive. One is the manuka honey. If you have 100% manuka in your frame, it'll set like jelly and be hard to get out no matter what type of beekeeping you're doing. It just doesn't like to come out of the frames. So people uh, going for that type of honey will use like frame prickers and hot rooms and warm extractions, all sorts of things in order to harvest honey from manuka. We do have uh, species similar here, the jelly bush, gets called Australian manuka uh, and it can set in the frames too. But really if it's hard to get 100% in your frame, so if it's 50-50 we find it'll still flow out. So if, if, if you've got manuka mixed with other blossoms then you'll find it'll come out in these jelly blobs into your jar and you can really spot it as they go over the falls here. So um, that's one thing. The other thing you can get is candied honey. Now candied honey, it doesn't tend to candy or fully candy in the hive because of the configuration we have with the honey super right above the brood nest. So that keeps it warm. So, but in really cold times, you can sometimes find the edge frame on uh, you know, specific types of nectar will start to cloud up or go candied. But it's rare to have it set so candied that it actually won't come out. So you'll find that your flow hive will work nicely in New Zealand. Great, so get beekeeping all you Kiwis. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Amber's asking yesterday when checking on their bees, notice that one of the bees, the wings look like twigs, otherwise the bee looked really strong. Um, they read that the shaped wings could be a sign of the mites. Do their wings break down? 
Amber's question is. Okay, let us know whereabouts in the world you are. Yeah. Uh, it, but there is something called deformed wing virus, which the mites, as you say, do bring. So the mites are one thing, they suck on the fat body of the bee, and that does weaken them a bit, but what weakens them more is the diseases they bring, and one of them is deformed wing virus. Um, so we don't have Varroa around here, but some parts of New South Wales are still trying to eradicate the, the mites. Uh, but in other continents you do have the mites, so um, send, send a picture or um, sh share it with uh, your local beekeepers and um, that way you can identify whether it's deformed wing virus or not. Oh, now Mrs Kay's just pointed out saying, careful Cedar, there's a scary spider on the side of the jar and I can just see it on the edge there. It's almost camouflaged. Oh yeah, that's a huntsman, that's a baby. Um, they get as big as your hand around here and they look really quite mean but they don't have any venom and they, they only give you a, a, a bite if you um, hassle them. So they're friendly really. <laughs> Nice. Now, someone's just asking the yellow dots that you can see um, on the side of the window seat are wondering, is, is, are the yellow dots pollen? No, they're wax. So some bees go crazy producing wax and others don't. So this hive, for whatever reason, has gotten a bit carried away with their wax producing functions. They have wax glands like we do in our ears, but they make nicer wax and uh, they not in their ears, but they secrete um, wax and then use their mandibles to make the comb. So they've just gotten a bit carried away and there's dots of wax on the, uh, the viewing window as well. Doesn't really matter, but some hives will do that. Nice. This is um, someone, Kath, from down on the south coast here and have had a very dry winter of New South Wales. Just wondering, will that encourage an earlier harvest or are the bees able to harvest more honey? Dry winter? Um, yeah, it really depends uh, how far south you are in New South Wales. But certainly what we're seeing is the winter coming a little bit earlier. Um, than it did 10 years ago. So, that, sorry, the spring coming a little bit earlier than it did 10 years ago. So here we are with some hives, even looking like they need to be split or they'll swarm. And when we uh, just started the last month of, of winter here. So it's um, really quite early. If you have a look at this hive, you can hardly see the um, the frames we were going to do a split but there was rain showers and wind today and we decided to put that off till next week. Next week we'll split this hive because look you can hardly see the frame at all because the bees are already thinking it's springtime, they're building up and if we're behind the eight ball this hive may swarm. So if you look in your, your window like this you can't see the frame because the bees are so tightly packed together and a good idea to take a split or add another box or do some spring management to make sure your hive isn't going to swarm. Especially important in New South Wales here in Australia at the moment where we don't want any uh, varroa spreading it, uh, from our red zones and around the red zones. So um, th th those areas, if you're, if you're around one of the red zones in New South Wales then make sure you're really onto your spring management, stopping hives from swarming is something that you can do to help and it's a good thing to do to um, limit swarming because you can't really hang around all day waiting for your hive to swarm and then go and catch it. Uh, so getting ahead of the curve, taking your splits is a great thing to do in the springtime or as soon as you see the bees really breeding up like that. Mm. So it's um, mindful Max asking, does the key harm the bees or that section of the flow frame where you've put the flow key in? No, it doesn't. The bees aren't actually in that area. They're, uh, if you have a look up here, it's just a mechanism really. So um, at the top of the frame there's a mechanism the bees don't get in there unless you leave those caps off. And that way when you put this key in, you're just going into an empty space and no bees are harmed. 
The next question was about the actual flow frame itself. Now, if it's all capped, the bees will just be standing on the surface while the honey drains out from beneath their feet. If it's not capped and you've got empty cells and bees down them, and you probably shouldn't be har harvesting yet. However, often you've got a frame that's all capped except for a little bit and you might have some bees down the cells. So we actually um, put years of work and a whole other patent into designing so the bees wouldn't be harmed uh, if the bees were down the cells when you harvested. And we did that by making gaps between the flow frame parts where the bees build bridges. So you can imagine if the parts were against each other and they moved and came back, a bee could put its leg or its wing in that area and get stuck as the parts came back together at the end of harvesting. So what we did is we put a bee-shaped gap in there and that means that they've got to build their wax across that zone, moves up, moves down, and then there's a gap there then for the bee's knees. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that works, works really nicely. So um, if at, at worst, you might get a bee stuck in a bit of wax and uh, the other bees will come and free it. Oh, nice. Now, Carl, you're just asking about um, supplies in South Africa. Best thing is to contact our fabulous customer support team and they will help you out there. Um, now, that, this is a good question. What would the bees do with the honey if it wasn't collected? So they just store it for a big, long time without flowers, which is often winter in many areas. So they're storing it for the winter. And lucky for us, they store more than they need often and we can share some too. But it is important to leave honey in the hive for those times with no flowers. But the flow frames are quite versatile. You can just take even a part of a frame if you're not sure whether the bees have enough honey for themselves. Or you can take one frame. So in this case, we've got uh, six frames across here. So we're taking one sixth of the honey and leaving the rest for the bees. But you could also put the key in halfway and take one twelfth of the honey out of the hive and you'd end up with half of one of these jars which is still plenty of honey to last your family a few weeks. So uh, it's a nice versatile way to do your harvesting, it's just bit by bit, it's less disturbance to the hive and it also um, means that you can do things like harvest a little bit, still have some honey but leave the rest for the bees. Seeds, if the outside of the flow frame looks capped on the hive, would it be safe to take the honey from the middle? Uh, yes, unless you've just harvested it. So uh, nice idea to get a bit of a log book on that and um, also watch in the windows. If you, if you notice that it's looking like this, this is probably a better example. And you can see it's not quite full yet. We're looking on the side seeing it's not quite full yet. So you might wait uh, until you're seeing the honey in these cells before you go and harvest them. Now, sometimes some bees can be tricky and for whatever reason they don't like to fill the cells at the end. So if that's the case, you'll have to get a bit tricky yourself and start looking in down the sidelines to see the, the uh, capping and you might need to pop a frame just to understand what's going on in that hive. Most hives will fill the end cells so. though. Uh, Big fella's asking, do you need a second queen to do a split or can you just put half the bees into a second box? The type of split we're going to do next week is called a walk away split where we won't actually be putting another queen in. It's the easiest type of split to do. You don't need to buy a queen in. You can simply let the hive raise a new queen and to do that you just need eggs on the frame in the hive you're, you're splitting and if you haven't found the queen and you don't know which box she's in then just make sure there's eggs on a frame in this heart one and eggs on a frame in the split you've just made and that way the, the bees can then feed uh, one of those young larvae royal jelly all the way through till she becomes a queen and so the hive can can raise a queen if there's eggs on a frame in that hive. So that's the easy way to go and we'll be showing you just how to do that next week live. Great. Christian coming in wondering, where's all the baby bee larvae? It's in the bottom box here. So you'll get to see that uh, next week live and also if you dial back on last week's video, we were 
having a look at a, the brood in a hive up on the balcony. You can have a look at that one as well and you'll see all the young larvae. And there in the bottom box we have a queen excluder to stop the queen coming up and laying eggs in your honey super and that way you don't get larvae in your honey. Nice. Now Rams is asking, would it be something I could have in my house backyard without disturbing my neighbours or my family? Certainly a lot of people keeping bees in their backyards. Trace keeps bees in her backyard. I She's do. reading out the questions. She's got a couple of hives there and she brings in wonderful honey, different flavours than we get here. And yeah, it's very popular even in the city even in uh, multi-storey buildings on balconies, people are keeping bees. Having said all of that, uh, if you are keeping bees in close proximity to others, then you're best off buying bees from a queen breeder. Nice, gentle bees will be, will be the ones you want in an environment where there's people close by. Not a bad idea to check in with your neighbours. It always goes a long way if you bring a jar of honey when you do. They get the idea and uh, it keeps your neighbours sweet and um, because there is uh, one thing called anaphylaxis which is like the uh, people get from eating peanuts sometimes and other allergic reactions some people can get it from stings and so that if you um, have a neighbour that happens to have that most people get swelling and that's normal but anaphylaxis is a, is a whole different story so worth, worth checking in with those around you as well. Having said that, bees are everywhere in our environment too. Most often people get stung by stepping on clover and things like that with bare feet. Um, so uh, having a beehive will increase the numbers of bees around that area though. Situating your beehive and uh, where the flight path is is another consideration. So if you're in a small backyard and um, you don't want to point it straight over your neighbour's fence for instance. Um, you might want to choose a spot where there's not a pathway just here because right here is where you're more likely to get stings in front of the hive and uh, there's a flight path going perhaps if you've got a pathway there a bee might accidentally end up in somebody's hair and sting someone on the head things like that so pointing the um, the flight path, which usually comes straight out of the hive up and away, in an area where people aren't is a good idea. And there's a lot more to, to learn. We've got episodes called Situating Your Hive to have a look at as well. Oh, great. So that might also lead on to another question from someone who lives in an apartment in LA and just run wondering what hive you would recommend. And it's a question sometimes too that's pretty common, like I think people think could they get a smaller beehive and then it would be better for them in a city or in the apartment but you can't really can you like this this, this is the size this is about as small as you can go it, just a single brood box and a single top box you can run smaller hives theoretically but what happens is they breed up and swarm really quickly because their home isn't big enough for them so so this is about as small as you want to be going with a hive. This is our smaller size, the, the six frame uh, flow hive, or it's compatible with the eight frame Langstroth. So um, that is about as small as you can go, but it's pretty amazingly small in my books. You've got something that's this big. All of the harvesting equipment is here. You don't need a whole laundry or garage full of harvesting spinners and hot knives, decapping and buckets and sieves and all of the things that I used to have. Here it is. This is all you need. You're harvesting your honey and you've got a real amount of produce from a very small footprint which could be on a balcony and without having a yard at all. So that's um, one of the wonderful things about beekeeping with a flow hive. Um, just a question coming in, Seeds, how come we're not using an entrance reducer? So there are times when we, well we don't really use them at all around here, except for we will turn them upside down as an entrance closure if we're moving a hive. And sometimes if we've got a very weak colony and there's not much nectar around, we can put an entrance reducer on to uh, allow that hive to guard its entrance better because if you haven't got much nectar around and somebody accidentally leaves a frame of honey out or something like that, 
and the bees get a taste for robbing, then they might rob that weak colony. Having a small entrance will allow those bees to defend themselves, less likely to get uh, issues of the small colony being robbed out um, and decimated. So that's the times when you might use them. If you're in a colder um, area, then you might put it on over winter to, to reduce a bit of airflow and give them a, a smaller entrance that also might stop things like mice getting in. However, I have heard that the size of our entrance is already nice and narrow and most mice can't get in. We don't have those issues here, but it's more for those long cold winters where the bee ball is moving up. No one's guarding downstairs and mice move in and start making a nice home in your brood box, which is a bit annoying. <laughs> um, so that's an, in those type of places, entrance reducers will help. Great. So Terry's in Adelaide in South Australia and has the Flow Hive 2 and it's full of bees and honey and just wondering should I do a split now as Harry doesn't want the bees to swarm? Yeah, good idea. I mean it's probably a little bit early in Adelaide but if, if, if you're looking in your windows and it looks like this hive over here where you can hardly see the comb then and you've got bees bringing in pollen and nectar then yes. Take, take a split, you might, um, and you can decide whether to start with a smaller split or what's called an even split where you take half the frames and put them in another box. It's a good idea to be prepared for, for the spring, get your equipment, get another box ready. Uh, you just need to, your base, your brood box and your roof, you don't need to get the super ready yet. And then you can take your splits and we'll show you how to do that live next week. Fantastic. Seeds, do you ever do a deep clean um, of the flow hive? So what people are finding is after about five years, the, it starts to get hard to see through the rear window. So what people are finding is a pressure washer can help blast that gunk off, get it back to a better view here. And you can see that here on this hive. These frames are um, about five years old now still working nicely but you can see the, um, the view is uh, getting impeded by all the propolis build up and so on. So a hot pressure washer is even better to clean that. So um, if your frames are starting to look like that, you might choose a time after you've harvested honey to take those frames out, get a pressure washer, even better feed that pressure washer with the hot water from a hot water service. and you, and um, just blast down with the frame in the open position so all the water can run out and that way you can clean a whole lot of the old wax and gunk off, let them dry out and put them back in the hive. How do you know when, when to stop harvesting honey, honey so that the bees have enough for winter? So that's a great question to ask your local beekeepers because it's very specific to your locale. If um, perhaps if you let people know where you are, then people in your area will chime in and let you know um, whether you get uh, uh, some places you do get an autumn flow, some places you don't, for example, and um, it's often repetitive each year in that area. Not always, so sometimes you mess it up and you've taken too much honey away and then you might need to feed them to get enough stores for winter, things like that. And the, another question that's a bit like that one, how long has it taken to produce this, this amount of honey in this hive? So this honey has come in over the last couple of months actually, slowly, steadily, um, over the, it's probably been the last three months. So a lot of that was wind, uh, our winter where it was pretty slow but still trickling in and now it's just picking up. Um, so can be slow and can be fast. So when spring really hits here, the bees will just be going crazy, like a frenzy collecting nectar from so many different flower sources. And you might harvest all of the honey in the box and the very next week it's totally full again. So that gets pretty exciting at times like that, but equally you can get three, four, five months with not much honey coming in or even get no honey that season. So like it, 
Like any time of farming, the, the weather really affects it, whether you've had rains at the right time for the flowers and so on. So uh, sometimes you need a bit of patience. <laughs> and that might be a similar to this one. Teagues is in California and has had the super on for about three months, but it doesn't seem like there's many bees going up into the super, uh, not seeing many through the windows. Any tips or tricks on that? Okay, sometimes it can be a bit slow. The best recipe for fast action on the flow frames is lots of bees in the hive and lots of nectar available, and it happens very quickly. But if either of those things are out, then it might be quite slow. Uh, but one trick you can do, which is, um, that's not the best example to show you because all we can see is bees there. But one, one thing you can do is scrape some wax off the top of the brood frames with your hive tool and mash it into the flow frame surface. You won't damage the flow frames. Put that flow frame on that window side and enjoy watching them recycle that wax. And that'll get them going in that little area. And, but you probably won't see much action until the, there's a big flow on in your area. If you find that you've got a number of hives and one is slow and the others are really bringing in the honey, then it may be the case that your queen is failing a bit, not laying enough eggs, and you might need to get in there and replace her with a young virile queen that can lay lots of eggs. How do you flavour, flavourise, oh is that a word, flavour honey? So. It, that is uh, something that people muck around with. I find the honey is amazingly flavoured in itself and really enjoy the different types of honey. But if you want to um, take it a step further, you can simply put things in the honey, like people might chop up some ginger, put it in a honey to give it a ginger flavour, or put lavender in it for a lavender flavour, and so on. And yeah, honey is a, is a nice preserver. You've just got to be careful not to add things with too high moisture content, or that might um, get fermentation happening in your jar. And instead of flavoured honey, you'll have flavoured mead. Oh, nice. Oh, this might be, now Scott's asking, can you harvest honey that isn't kept from the flow frames, assuming the moisture is low enough, saying that they have a good nectar flow on at the, mo at the moment, and the entire box is mostly uncapped? You can, and by all means experiment. It's something that um, beekeepers try not to do usually because they're trying to get the moisture content low enough so the honey will keep indefinitely on the shelf. But if you plan to consume it, then go ahead and try it. You'll find the flavour will be stronger and the floral notes will be even brighter. And some chefs here in Australia have actually purposefully harvested unripe honey for the uh, the amazing flavour that it's had. So by all means you can go ahead and try that. And you can just try just part of a frame if you like and leave the rest for the bees to continue. So you might just put this key in a little way and you know, you, the minimum on the frames is just one cell line and you can get to taste what that flavour is and it helps you to connect that honey that's coming in with what's flowering around and it helps you to identify what the flower source is. So that's a fun thing to do, just harvest a tiny bit, give it a taste. And also when friends come, you're not quite ready to harvest, but you really want to show them, then you can just harvest a, 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 a few cells and let them taste the honey straight from the hive. Can you still harvest beeswax from the flow frames? No, not from the flow frames. You won't get beeswax from the flow frames, but in the brood nest, you, you will still be able to get beeswax because they're just conventional frames and in our case we, we mostly do naturally drawn frames so there's not even any wire in there. You can cut comb out, chew on that, keep the beeswax and so on. Or you could add a whole other box dedicated for collecting honey comb and then use the wax from that. Or you could let the bees up into the roof section, they'll make a whole lot of random honeycomb up there for you to, to uh, cut up and enjoy and also keep the wax. Um, this is quite, do they outgrow the hives? I guess the, the colony maybe, I'm not quite sure. The, they, do you outgrow the hive? <laughs> the bees? The, the bees, they will in the springtime, not 
not always, it depends on the genetics of the hive, but often if you've got a big flow in the springtime, the bees will not have enough room for the queen to lay. That's the primary trigger of swarming. Half the bees will kick out the queen, they'll take off and start a new colony. The old hive will raise a new queen and keep going, and that's how bees naturally divide. So in a way, they are outgrowing their hive size. Uh, you can Oh, you can add more boxes to increase the size of your hive. That's something people do a lot. Um, I like to run them just like this because it's very easy to do your brood inspections and so on. It keeps it simple, but it does mean you're more likely to get swarms if you don't do your splits and spring management. So you, you, there's a few, uh, few different pros and cons there. If you're in colder regions, people will often add another brood box just so there's a lot of honey stores in that second brood box. And that means they've got plenty to survive a long, cold winter. Nice. Um, Carl's got to set up one brood and one super, one brood chamber and one super. Could, it, could you increase it and have two broods to one super? Absolutely. That's a very common thing to do in those colder regions. And uh, but I would recommend starting in this configuration, get them started on the flow frames first before adding another brood box. Otherwise you'll just be waiting a long time and writing to us saying that bees aren't building on my flow frames yet. <laughs> but if you, if you leave it smaller like this, they'll start on the flow frames much earlier. And then you can go mucking about adding more boxes, more supers or more brood boxes as you like. As a beginner, what would you recommend is the best way to get started with becoming a beekeeper? The way I like to do things is I just jump in the deep end and I just get the, get the equipment, get some bees and go. Um, other people like to be, you know, some people research for years before they do something. So it really depends on what um, type of learner you are. But what I'd recommend is just grabbing our bundle because it comes with a bee suit, comes with the smoker, comes with all of these hive components, gloves, tools, and everything you need to get started, except your bees you'll need to get from your local area and also what finish you want to put on your hive you'll get from your local hardware store. We do have a great online course if you like video learning at thebeekeeper.org. It's um, free to try. It's also an amazing fundraiser. We've planted 1.5 million trees so far to create billions of blossoms for our bees and the myriad of life that depends on habitat to, to forage on and live in. So that's, that's an exciting program, gets rave reviews. You can take a look at that at thebeekeeper.org. Otherwise. There's a community here, we're here each week answering questions and we've got uh, hundreds if not thousands of videos now out there showing you all sorts of things about bees. Um, Ross um, Cedar has six flow hives in the northeast of the of USA and would like to also add some medium supers. Just wondering should, should he super on top of the super or under the super? Okay, so like everything in beekeeping, there's a complicated answer. <laughs> so it depends on what type of frame you're putting in there. If you're using foundation, you can go either way. Generally, beekeepers in a commercial sense will like to under super because bees like to stash the gold at the furthest away from the entrance. It'll be a bit less work for the bees because if you put it straight on top, they might start moving honey up first and um, then start filling in the bottom where if it's underneath they'll just get straight in to that box and leave the honey that you've just lifted up in the other box if that makes sense. Uh, but having said that, I, if you're not you know, going for that commercial edge of maximum production, just do what's a bit easier, put it on top. Um, having said that, if you're using naturally drawn comb with no foundation at all, then what happens if you just put that on top is the bees will often start at the bottom building comb and it gets all really wonky. So in that regard, you're better off having it lower down or even under the brood box for them first to build the comb. So naturally drawn comb is better starting at the top and hanging down, um, in which case 
you put it right at the bottom, let them build it up and then move it to the top once they've built If you leave uncapped honey in the flow frames during winter, will it get candied and if so then how do you get it out? Uncapped honey. Yeah. Um, it's less likely to go candied because the moisture content isn't low enough yet. The if, um, so you could just leave it there for, and the bees will consume that first. They'll tend to consume anything uncapped first. So you could just leave that for the bees. The, um, you can get candying issues in some really cold places uh, with honey in the hive, but uh, we don't seem to have any issue with that here. And it doesn't actually seem to be a big issue. We don't hear about people having issues with candied honey in flow frames. And I think it's because the bees do keep it a bit warm during that winter and they also consume the remaining honey if there's a long cold winter as well and then it's ready to be filled up again in the springtime. Can you add a flow hive onto a traditional beehive? Yes, so you can just get our flow frames and cut your own cutout. We've got a, uh, some information somewhere that shows you how to do some cutouts to put the flow frames in your uh, conventional box or you can buy our frames and the super which is just this box and frames and put that on a conventional uh, Langstroth hive. So the, we have two sizes to fit the two main Langstroth sized hives. They do vary a bit so you'll find there'll be small discrepancies in size but it'll be close enough for you to add a super. One thing though is getting the tilt right. So you can see how we're, we've got a tilt facing back this way um, and that allows the honey to flow out in this direction. It is typical with a conventional hive to tilt it the other way. And if, it, if it's just got a straight flat bottom board, no screen bottom board, then you might find tilting it back like this you'll get water coming in the entrance and pooling at the back here, which isn't good. So without a screen bottom board, if you've got a conventional base, then you, you'll be probably tilting it back just for when you harvest. Uh, and then changing the tilt again. So a little bit annoying. And it also messes up this little leak back mechanism, which is designed to have the tilt constantly this way. So any honey that actually does dribble through into this trough area goes back to the bees but if you've got it tilted the other way most of the time then that'll mess that up so you've got a few considerations there when deciding whether to just add it to a conventional hive or buy the whole kit and swap the bees into it. Ross has just come back, so it's the one um, Ross who was asking in the USA about putting the super above or below, saying that they have such a small season over there they often use foundation on their frames because they don't kind of have time to go foundationless. Yeah, my experience is bees build extremely quickly on foundationless frames, so it'd be great for you to do an experiment with uh, and you might have already done this, you sound like an experienced beekeeper. Um, when I'd done experiments with foundation, no foundation and plastic foundation in a box, I found the order went something like this. They would draw comb in the empty space first, then they would build on the wax foundation and take a long time before they'd build on the plastic foundation, even if it was coated in wax. So um, you might find that they're just as quick actually on naturally drawn frames but it is a bit easier because they will build straight if you're adding the box on top to go um, with foundation sheets as well so a few things to consider there. Um, the question I've got two colonies of bees and one colony is always wild any thoughts on why that might be? So genetics is the, the main Thing. So when the queen does her mating flight, she'll mate with up to 30 drones or more from the surrounding area. She has her own genetics and then the genetics from those drones or male bees she's mated with. And that sets her genetics. She doesn't mate again for the rest of her laying life. And so the, the temperament 
of that hive will stay set until that queen changes. So if you do find one hive's wild or a bit aggressive, and that's not, um, not great for, for you or those around, then you can get in there, take that queen away, and replace it with a queen of known genetics from a queen breeder. And then a month later, your hive will completely change temperament, and you'll have a nice, gentle, and hopefully productive hive. If that's a bit daunting, because sometimes when your hive's a bit wild and you've got to get in there and find the queen, then that's a bit of a daunting task. You might like to get a hand from an experienced beekeeper if you're not up for that task, or if you uh, are experienced, then you can get in there and do that. Does the flow hive work with native bees? No, so, well, if you're in Europe, yes, this is the European honeybee, but um, here in Australia, they are a, a uh, imported species, and the native bees here that do produce honey are called um, Tetragonula carbonaria bees, which are a little tiny black fly looking bee, and they do produce a small amount of honey each year. You can probably harvest maybe one kilogram from a hive a year, something like that. But it's a completely different comb structure. It's, and then the hive's only about this big, and the comb structure is a spiral with grape-like pollux in it. And it's very cool, but um, it's not really enough honey to harvest to warrant creating a whole spiral version of the flow frames. If, if I buy a hive, will the bees just find their way naturally into the hive? Sometimes, but rarely. So if you happen to be near a whole lot of hives like this, and in fact, we'll do this soon. We'll put what's called bait hives and we'll put the hives six to 12 feet off the ground. And some of those hives, if it will become a new home for a swarm, if we happen to have a swarm, they'll go into that bait hive. So if you just are at home away from other beehives and you set up your hive, it'll be very unlikely that bees will come and populate it, but uh, it could happen. So the best way to get started for you would be to take a split, which we'll be showing you next week, from somebody else's hive, or order a nuke, which is probably the easiest way to get started, which is a going little hive, which is about half of the frames in one of these boxes. So it's just a little mini hive with a, with a queen that's laying, it's got honey stores, pollen stores, everything. It's a going little hive, and you can buy that Place it where you want to situate your hive, let it settle in. When the timing's right for you, get in your bee suit, your smoker out, and you just simply transfer those frames into the bottom box. Look after them and they'll grow. And when they're built up, you put your super on and away you go. Now, Seeds, I don't know if you'll know the answer to this one, but do you know when there'll be more modules coming on the beekeeper.org? Oh, stay tuned for that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, con customer support might know, I wasn't sure whether you'd know that. Fantastic, let us know what you've thought so far yeah. of the content on the beekeeper.org. Um, what works best to get rid of hive beetles? So, hive beetles are a bit of an annoying thing. They, um, they're not really a problem. We have a pest management tray here in the bottom, which um, we can pull out if I can. I can have a little bit of rain. There we go. So in this tray here, we can use this to catch the beetles. So you give your tray a little clean out. It's a bit of debris in there. And then we put some cooking oil in there, and the hive beetles will get chased through the screen bottom board at the bottom, and they'll die in the cooking oil. So that's one good way to get rid of them, or at least reduce the numbers. So if your hive's weak at the time, let's say they've swarmed, if you've got hive beetles in your area, great idea to activate your pest management tray, start catching some of those beetles. Uh, you can also use soapy water in here, is another one, but it does evaporate more quickly, but it's also nice and clean compared to 
oil, which you know is a bit more gunky to clean out later. I'd only really do that in the summer months because you don't want a tray of water sitting here over winter creating excess condensation. Um, so it's what, what makes the bees beard? Okay, bee bearding. On the front, bee, bee, bee beard. <laughs> bee bearding. <laughs> bee so, bearding. So that's the term and you can't see it on any of these hives yet but give it probably three weeks you'll start to see some bee beards around here where you've, you've literally got a beard of bees hanging down from the hive like that. And there's multiple reasons why they'll do that. Now, it's one of the signs that your hive might be going to swarm if they've got a big hanging down beard off the landing board here. Now, uh, and another reason they could do it, let's say if your hive's just chockers like this, you've, you, you're looking in here, you can't see the frames, there's so many bees. If you then harvest all your frames at once, there's a lot for the bees to clean up. They will need to create some space in the hive because they simply can't work like that. And a, a lot of bees will come out and beard off the front while they repair uh, all of the um, flow frames that you've just harvested. That's another reason. Another one is if it's just hot, then you'll find a lot of bees just enjoying the evening air veranda out the front here and you might get a bit of a beard in those hot times in those summer months so it's a normal thing when your hive's healthy and the numbers are strong I'm um, saying so if I get a flow hive does that mean that I'll never have to do an inspection inside my hive? No so if you're not comfortable doing the inspections you'll need to find somebody who is but what we find is people think oh they don't want you know they don't necessarily want to do that part of the beekeeping but after a while they find that that's an amazing thing to be doing and learning about the world of bees and getting into the brood box so your hive will need to be inspected periodically or if there's any issues present to inspect for pests and disease down here in the brood box have a look at last week's video we showed you how to do a brood inspection. Uh, Ben's in Canberra and just wondering are there any steps that we can be taking now to help prepare our hives for what we expect will be a very long hot summer? Long hot summer, um, what steps to prepare the hive? Okay, um, well the bees are great at d doing air conditioning and cooling their hive but the main thing is doing your spring management so um, whereabouts in the world are they? Canberra. Canberra okay yeah. so spring management it, you'll be a bit behind in Canberra uh, because uh, it's still cold there but in in the next few months as the bees breed up and you see the uh, this many bees in your window then add more boxes or do a hive split is what you need to do to do some spring management less than the likelihood of swarming. If you don't want another hive somebody else surely will. I find splits uh, the best way to go. It really reduces congestion and cycles out frames and so on. So it's a great way to go but if you don't want another hive or don't want to do that then you need to do some spring management by adding another box or um, simply cutting out a lot of comb from the honey frames that are usually on the edge and moving them towards the center so there's fresh real estate for the bees to build and the queen to lay in in the center here and that's another way you can relieve congestion harvesting honey is a good one as well if you leave a lot of honey in a hives full of honey sometimes the bees have got a lot of honey down in the brood box and they've got nowhere to move it so there's nowhere for the queen to lay and that can trigger swarming also so harvesting the honey as the spring flow comes on is a great thing to do as well. Oh that's great Sid because that was the another question that came in that if you don't want to do a split and you don't know what to do with the split how else do you prepare for spring without having to do that so I think you kind of answered that one there. Great and um, we showed you a couple of weeks ago how to cut out some comb from the brood box it's quite an easy thing to do to to freshen up some real estate down here for the queen to lay on um, and we will be doing more of that in the coming weeks as well because we've got 
the spring approaching here in Australia. Nice. Well, here's a lucky last question from Nicole. Not sure where Nicole is, but just wondering, everyone's talking swarms here at the moment. If the bees do swarm and half the hive is left, does the queen stay or go? The queen goes, so the old queen leaves. So the queen you've currently got here, if this hive swarmed, she'd get kicked out. She doesn't really want to go, but half the bees would kick her out the hive and away they go, temporary landing spot. That's the opportune moment to catch the swarm when they're sitting on a branch out near the hives. Uh, but yeah, it's interesting. The old queen leaves and they raise a new queen in the brood box. Sometimes they don't and you're left with a queenless hive, but most of the time they do. Nice. All right, I'm going to squeeze one more in because Carl's coming in saying, there's the age old saying, don't fix what's not broken. Are there any new future ideas for the flow hive design? Ah. <laughs> well, we always have ideas and if you've got ideas for us, then put it in the, uh, then share them or feature requests and um, let us know. Here we are. These, this, um, these frames are, are now um, five years old and we're harvesting honey from them and it's looking good. We've got a beautiful full jar there. We might just put the key in the top slot now and close off that frame. So when I turn this back to a 90 like that, all the uh, pathways that the honey was draining through are now moving back to being hexagons again and we can then finish up our harvest. I could leave it there a bit longer and we would probably top out this jar, but what I'm gonna do is just let the rest go back to the bees by doing a little swap here, a quick um, swap like this, and just poke that cap in. Now this here can just rest on the edge of the jar like that. Oh, nice. Put remaining honey to go in. <laughs> And there you have it, nice full jar of honey. If you can, then leave this turned in that 90 degree position in the top slot to just allow some time for the parts to move down. We have found that that's a good tip. Leave it there for a minute if you can. And that just means all of the flow frame parts move back in their correct position. If you do a little quick close, they might bounce back and then you've creating issues and problems later with excess wax build up in these little areas, cells out of line, sp spilling in the hive and so on. So that's a good tip, just leave that for a little bit as you pack up your honey. Look at that. That is very oh, the spider. dark honey. Oh, there it comes. Oh, there's the spider. The spider's oh. in the honey. Oh. Look at that. There we go, special black spider honey for Halloween. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, look how dark that Whoa. is. Here, you can go back to the hive. There we go. Um, that's a huntsman friendly spider. Well, friendly-ish. They'll give you a nip, but they've got no poison. Look at that, you can't, you can't even see through it. Beautiful dark honey. It's amazing how different it is. Sometimes it's so light, it's like a, just a very light yellow colour. And here it is, almost so, black. What do you think, Seed? Like why, why, what plants? Where has it been that it's so black? Like You white? know, I still haven't completely worked out which flower yeah, makes yeah. it so black around here, but it comes from down in the valley here. At one point, I thought maybe it was, it was actually sugarcane but there's very little sugar cane left now. It's mainly converted to maccas and we're still getting it. So it must be, uh, it must be the, uh, the Banksias here in the Heathland is my next guess. Mmm, yum. Thanks a lot for watching. Let us know if there's anything you'd like us to specifically cover. Tune in same time next week and we'll do a live split from this hive here as part of the Be Prepared Spring Management